Hey, uh, just before we start, if you hear any loud banging, it's because there are construction guys putting in my new studio. Mm, exciting. Banging wood and doors and stuff. <laughs> uh, but I can't hear them. Like, I'm in a different, completely different part of the house. But uh, I just wanted to preface that. So, Jonathan Stark, welcome to my world. Yes, Carl. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, this podcast isn't topic specific. It's just, I have met many fascinating people in my life and times, and, uh, I invite some of them to come on and talk about themselves. And you're one of them, man. I'm honored. Yeah. So, uh, where do we start? I mean, so you, in a past life, were a software developer. You're about my age. Uh-huh. Also a guitar player and played in a band. Yep. Um, the software uh, stack that you used is completely different from mine. But yes, we under- we're on the other opposite sides of the fence. Yeah, you're like the LAMP stack, which is like Linux and uh, open source yeah. tools. Apache, and- PHP, MySQL. Apache. Yeah. Apache and M. What is M in the LAMP stack? MySQL. MySQL. Yeah. Or and PHP. My SQL, depending on who you talk to. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, the reason that our paths crossed is that um, we interviewed you for .NET Rocks. I'm not sure who found who. Did you reach out to us, or did somebody... I don't remember. Yeah. I don't usually do that, but it's possible because your show is so prominent that I bugged you. Or yeah. it could have been a mutual introduction. That's more likely. It m- more likely was. I don't really remember either, but... Anyway, um, I found myself interviewing you several years ago. and uh, Probably 10. You, yeah. You were talking about your, your Starbucks uh, thing, which uh-huh. is great a great story. You got to tell this story. I mean, first of all, for the listeners, John, I like Jonathan because he's an innovator. He sees uh, an opportunity and immediately has that engineering, creative engineering mind to, okay, how do I make this better? Or, or how can I, you know, benefit from this or whatever Exploit it is. Exploit this for my own ends. Absolutely. <laughs> but in doing so, you kind of, you know, invent things. And um, we'll, we'll talk about the, the value pricing later. But tell the Starbucks story. You were, we were just at dinner and I yeah. had you tell it to my wife. I know. I was like so out of practice of telling this story. I used to be great at it. Um, <laughs> the timeline is probably the easiest way. So, okay. It was something like 2010, 2011, and I was heavily into mobile consulting. That was the technology I was focused on at the time. And Right, so basically developing apps for phones. Mostly with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, though, so like web apps for phones. All right. And uh, But I was just very interested in it, and mobile payments was a thing that I was so sure was going to be a thing in 2011, and and Mm. it's still barely a thing, although... COVID, I think, accelerated yeah. the adoption with contactless payments. Um, but boy, it takes a long time for people to adopt cool stuff. Yeah. But back then, Starbucks was really the only app that's, or certainly one of the first that allowed you to pay with your phone, but it wasn't with uh, NFC or whatever. It was just like scanning a barcode, just like it was a loyalty card or a gift yeah. card. And I was I was fascinated by that because it was... Really, I love stuff that's sort of clever, low maintenance solution to uh-huh. MV. You know, it's just sort of MVP concept, and they already have viable product. Sorry, I got to translate because yeah, Grandma's listening to this show. Yeah, TLAs <laughs> all the way down. Yeah, so I was fascinated by this that they took such a low tech approach to something right. that that was. You know, people were really over, maybe not overthinking, but like it was going to be a complicated thing. But they were like, well, we could test yeah. this by just putting the barcode from our, our gift cards in the app. Right. So basically you have a gift card and you, what, can take a, a picture of the barcode on the gift card? They, they essentially, that- you could, but no one really, didn't seem that anybody was aware of that. It's certainly nobody that I'm, that I heard of. So Mm -hmm. what they did, they had these sort of reloadable gift cards, or I'm not sure if they're called gift cards, but they're they're sort of loyalty cards. Yeah, it's it's a little bit different than that. It's like a stored value card where you can put money on it and take money off of it. Yeah, 
And Dunkin' Donuts had the same thing. You basically pay 20 bucks online to fill it up. Yep. And then you just hand them your card. They debit the amount. And it's like a little temporary bank account. Yeah, it's a little. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I signed up for the app and and it worked on my iPhone. And it was pretty cool. You just scan it with a Bluetooth. Uh, sorry, not Bluetooth. Uh, uh, barcode scanner. Yes. And I was like, oh, well. It would be great if, uh, do you have an Android app? Because I had like 40 phones back then. So sometimes I'd be out with an iPhone or an Android mm-hmm. phone. Oh no, we don't have an Android phone yet. And that annoyed me because I was really anxious to like lose the wallet. I wanted to get rid of my wallet and just pay for mm-hmm. everything with my phone. And was that just for the cool factor of it? Or did you like literally have a fear of carrying your wallet around? Not a fear, but I'm a minimalist and I, I like to uh, have the, the smallest number of things on me at any given time. So when you travel to a foreign country, do you take like everything that fits in an overhead bin and just like wash your socks in the yeah, sink? Yeah, I'm one and- of those people. Yeah, <laughs> I am one of those people. Uh, so, so I, uh, so I went in, so I wanted, I, I was bummed. The tension, the pain was that I couldn't use my Android phone at Starbucks when I wanted to. Uh-huh. And I was at Starbucks like every day because I work from home. So I would, you know, I'd walk down to the local Starbucks. It's just down the street. And and I'd want to not have to bring stuff with me, not extra stuff. So I'd go down there. And so I was like, you know, I wonder if I take a screenshot of my iPhone uh-huh. and then like email that to myself and open it on Android. Uh-huh. If I can just scan the screenshot, it's just a barcode, right? I assumed it wouldn't work. I assumed they regenerated a unique barcode every single time. But guess what? They didn't. Uh and so there I am in Starbucks. I, I scan my Android phone in front of the barcode scanner and bleep, it, it debits my account. And I, my mind was blown. Right. Cause because it's a picture literally on your phone. I just, yeah, I paid for my breakfast with a picture. And Jeez. that doesn't sound super radical now, but that was radical at the time. I can imagine. So I, I, you know, I sat down to do my, my normal day of business and. I had a crappy blog that I occasionally posted to, and I was like, I'm going to post this. Pe-. I was like, I can't believe I just post. I just bought a coffee with a picture. I'm going to post <laughs> the picture on the internet and see what happens. All right, so, wait a second. Now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this mini bank account that you got in this loyalty card, and, mm-hmm. and you know, it wasn't a whole lot of money. You probably had what? If it had 50 bucks on it. 50 bucks on it. So you basically posted the picture and say, hey, take this picture, download it, and go have a coffee on me. Yeah. Huh. Right. And it was, I mean, it wasn't like I was given, I mean, I was giving away 50 bucks in theory, but it was, it was my job. I was a consultant yeah. in the mobile yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. So it was what like an that? experiment. Sure. So I posted it on my blog that nobody read and within a very short time, maybe 50, I was still sitting there. I was getting emails and, and tweets like, you know, you jerk, there was no money on that card. Like oh. you know, I, I literally got up from my desk and went down and scanned the code and it said no money on it. And I was like, whoa. So like I've, in how long? 15 minutes? Half an hour tops. Half an hour? <laughs> yeah. So now my mind's blown again because I right. had never posted anything on my blog that anyone reacted to at all, as far as I know. Never mind. Stopped what they're doing, got up, left their office, uh. and went to Starbucks. So that was like a huge... Obviously, you know, people got it, though. I mean, like, what? Okay. This guy wants to buy me a coffee, and all I got to do is take a picture and show it at right. Starbucks? Yeah, and I had it would be mostly developers that would have read my sure, blog. So yeah, they, they got the idea. They get it. Yeah, and and I I was like, no, I I'm sure there was fifty bucks, but turns out like twenty people, yeah, all like blew through the money in uh-huh. the first half hour. So I felt bad. So I put fifty more bucks on it. <laughs> boom, it was gone in ten minutes. I did it again. <laughs> boom, it was gone in ten minutes. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I just dropped hundred and fifty bucks you know, right. breakfast for other people, which was cool. I, you know, whatever. It wasn't that yeah, big a deal. Not big a deal. But I was like, I can't keep doing this, you know? So. Sure. So then it might've been that Friday. I was, we were watching TV and my phone dinged that said, and it said that my uh, account balance in that little mini bank account had been topped up. And huh? that, yeah, I was like, that made me nervous because it was attached to my checking account, one of my bank accounts. Right, but it wasn't going to dip into your bank account if somebody needed to use it, right? I mean, not automatically, but if someone was able to top up the card from my bank account, they could drain it. Oh, 
Oh, right. sure. Yeah. So is that what happened? Were they topping it up from your bank account or from no, theirs? No, it turns out one of my nerdy friends figured out that you could scan the card at a Starbucks location and put money on it. That is cool. Right. So you can go into a Starbucks. Oh, scan, mind blown times two. Mind blown times two. So I was like, wait a second. I can't afford to buy the internet a coffee, but the internet can. Mm. So... <laughs> it was like a Friday night. I stayed up for probably 36 hours straight. I made like a little micro site that explained how to put money on the card, explained mm. how to use the card. If you needed if you needed a coffee, here's how you do it. If you want to give somebody a coffee, here's what you do. Wow. And, uh, and that was like over the weekend. And then the I had written a couple of O'Reilly books before that. My senior editor had a blog on So by Make. the way, O'Reilly is a technical publisher. So they write... Uh, they publish books for programmers mostly. Yeah, back when there and were books. And IT people, yeah. And and my senior publisher, super cool guy, who uh, had a, he had a blog on make.com. And so he, he sort of, it was a little bit of a stretch because I didn't make, it was normally like robotic type stuff mm. and 3D printers and things like that. Mm-hmm. So this wasn't physical, but he was like, oh, it's really interesting. So he posted it on like Monday or something like that. And like it shot through the roof, activity shot through the roof. Wow. And it, well, it started to. And then the course of events is, you know, we're going back over 10 years. So the course of events is a little bit blurry, but things got real weird real fast. So it I mean, got you pe- basically just figured out a way to share a bank account with the internet. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was like, you ever see one of those inboxes that you can, disposable inboxes that you can use to like test, mm-hmm. test your email stuff. It was kind of mm-hmm. like that, but for money yeah. and a little, in a sense, a little bit like a smart contract when you think about it, but, but. So did Starbucks ever contact you and say, Hey, what are you doing? Hell yeah. So a whole bunch of stuff happened so really fast. Were, 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 were they threatening you at all or was it, because was it a violation of the agreement or? It was, but they were very cool about it. It was a violation of terms of use, but it wasn't illegal. And because uh, my wife was like, this seems like you're going to get in real trouble. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. You know. This seems like fraud. And I'm like, well, I don't. At the same time, you're showing the path to what's possible with yeah. the internet and simple mm-hmm. graphics. Yeah, it was amazing. Like with the existing infrastructure, like no change necessary. Right. Existing normal barcode scanners. I love that. So cool. It was so cool. It was such a hack, right? But speaking of hacks, I mean, like it, it hit the news cycle. It was on CNN and I was getting Whoa. interviewed on TV. I mean, MSN, I was on MS, MSNBC Live. And, wow. and yeah, it was crazy. So it like really hit the mainstream for like a week. I had like a, a million hits on my website in five days wow. and, and so of course people started to try and capitalize on the yeah, of news, course. news jacked it. Right. So like, yeah, there was a whole wave of people that were like, oh, this is a guerrilla marketing campaign from Starbucks. This yeah. is all fake. Uh, there was another person who, who wrote a blog post that was titled something like how to buy an iPad with Jonathan's card. <laughs> and cl- claimed claimed that he hacked it when really all he did was sit in a Starbucks and every time it got topped up, he just stole the money by putting it on his own card. Ugh. So he'd go up to the counter and it'd be like, he'd be like, oh, there's 50 bucks on it. And because it was the balance was published on Twitter every minute. Uh-huh. So he would see, oh, there's money on it. And he would swipe it and he'd, oh, could you transfer that to this card? And they'd be like, yeah. So he did that until he had about 500 bucks on there. Oh, man. Yeah. Meanwhile, there was a Facebook group for uh, it that my wife started, and she, you know we were getting stories on there like people were bringing homeless people in and swiping the card to buy them sandwiches and stuff. And then, oh, so cool! Yeah, you know. So what happened was the headline, and I've, I've literally never gone on Mashable dot com again because they were the ones that ran the clickbait story that said Jonathan's card hacked, eh. and it wasn't hacked. It was like this guy's just a jerk. Yeah, it's just being a jerk. Right, it, it's kind of a quintessential story of people who innovate. Right, mm-hmm. when you when you innovate something that's new, um, you generally don't think of how it can be gamed or how it can be scammed. You sort of assume that humanity is going to do the right thing, don't you? Yeah, you'd and, like to. Yeah, I I do. I mean, when when I come up with something new, and then I always run it by my wife Kelly, who's always uh you know yeah but if you're evil then you can right. do this i'm like oh yeah i suppose you can so right. well i'm glad <laughs> I, I, it's it, 
she's right. You know, it yeah. only takes like one bad apple, as they say, right, to yeah. ruin it. Because Starbucks was like, we they they had been in contact with me, and they were like, there were marketing people there who were like, this is amazing. Sure, but there were IT people there that were scared to death, right? Rightly so. I was an IT person. I understand. Mm-hmm. And then when the headlines started, you know, the news cycle is just like. The news cycle was like, as soon as they heard of this, it was like the good news story yeah. you know, during a presidential campaign year. And they were <laughs> like, they were like, oh, here's a slice of life that'll cheer you up after we <laughs> just told you about all those like dead puppies and wars and stuff. And, but you just know, I could feel it. I could feel in the questions. Like when I was on MSNBC, they're like, but aren't people going to use this for you? Like they were just waiting. Yeah, they sure. were waiting to write the story of how this yep. blew up in my face. Yeah. So Do when you it, remember how much money actually got transferred through that guard? It was from the Monday that it was on CNN to the Friday that Starbucks shut it down. It was like twenty thousand dollars. What? 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 Starbucks shut it down after a week after the after the hacking headlines showed up. The IT guys uh, couldn't stand it anymore, and they were like, okay. "I don't know. This is this is going to open us up to some kind of liability." Did they change their technology? What's to stop somebody else from doing what you did? Not nothing. Nothing. In fact, I did it again. Oh. But so that's the funny nature of viral stuff. It's like you can't, I mean, you can engineer it, but it's a lot of work. But Uh for something to be, I I learned so many, just a million really interesting, like literally dozens of very interesting lessons about like humanity and media and and one of the things was, if you want to get in the news, do something newsworthy. It's, it's like no yeah. magic. Like uh-huh. I used to be in bands, couldn't get press. It's like, well, no kidding, because we weren't doing anything interesting. Yeah, set your hair on fire and they'll come running. Yeah, you'll, you're right. You can't get <laughs> rid of them. I, for a week, I had the TV camera in my face. Yeah. And, and, you know, for doing, you know, 10 hours of work, maybe, not even. Right. And it's like, if you do something novel, the news will come running because they're looking for anything newsworthy sure and especially if you kind of outwit the the system which is yeah, what game you kind of did yeah so well, you didn't of, really yeah. game it but you you certainly outwitted it i definitely used it in a way that was not expected yeah, yeah. so and there was a and there was a everybody was like isn't that illegal like so there was uh-huh. a little bit of risk and there uh-huh. was a little bit of i i definitely had a shot of adrenaline go through me when my wife was like isn't that fraud and i was like oh my god maybe it is like yeah i end up in jail So there was this element of fear and like in a perception that I took some kind of risk. So I think that contributed to it. Was one of the dozens of lessons you learned about humanity, um, something I learned, which is that if anything is on the internet and then is not available, right? Like it got shut down, right? People will complain and make up all sorts of evil things about you. That you're doing this just for blah, blah, blah. It doesn't even work. Who is this idiot? Yeah, right? those tons of that. Yeah, and they don't even realize the, the history of it. Um, classic yeah. example is Facebook comments. So yeah. I learned about Facebook from uh, my friend Richard Morris that Facebook is designed to keep you scrolling. And they don't care about permanence at all. So he posted an article on the public in his public feed or news whatever whatever they call the public thing uh posts an article with scientific names about something that is absolutely unique right and then like a week later he searched facebook for it and said i don't don't have that and then on top of that you know you post something and you get a hundred comments 120 comments the first five comments somebody asks a question and you answer it. And then people will not go back and read all the comments. They will just keep asking the totally. same question totally. yes. over and over again. And so I we ended up just totally. saying a macro that says, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up, read all the comments, read all the comments. <laughs> you know, if they're not interested in conversation, Facebook users, they want to put a comment in. Like, react. Nobody else has thought of it. And they want an answer right now. Yeah, that's like my last name is Stark, and everybody, like every time somebody meets me, they're like, oh, you ever hear of Tony Stark? It's like, yeah, I have. <laughs> you ever get to borrow the suit? <laughs> right? Like that, they're the first person to think of that. Oh, are you related to Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you? <laughs> um, it, There's debate in my family. Just some say, yeah. say yes, some say yes, and others say no. 
But. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it was wild. It was wild. I mean, Al Roker was talking about it on the radio. I, and there he's was, a weatherman. Right. I mean, <laughs> it was that, it was, there was so much, I mean, there's always so much bad news every week, but there right. was, this was like the, this was the good news story that week. Yeah. And, and even the good news people were like, but aren't people going to abuse this? And uh, how long can it last? And it's like, come on. Right. And, but they were, you know, it, and it, it is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Sure. Sure. Hey. I still get people emailing me like, it, it, can I, I need to use, I'm, you know, I'm hungry. Can I use the card? It's like, oh, God, uh, wow. I just, I'm like, just give me your email address. I'll send you 10 bucks. Right. Wow. What a great story. It's wild. And so your, your, uh, uh, professional life has been full of things like this. And well, I at least know of one other thing that you continue to support, um, is this idea of value pricing, but, uh, I'm going to pause here for a commercial break and we'll be right back with Jonathan Stark. Hey, you're listening to what the hell's the name of this show again? Oh yeah. No excuse for boredom. There's no excuse. Um, so many shows, especially in 2023, by the way, do you know what the definition of a genius in the 2020s is definition of a genius? Mm -hmm. Somebody who can push the right button at the right time. Think about it. <laughs> what is a keyboard, but a row of buttons. And it's true. You know, right button at the right time. You're a genius. You're hired Uh wrong button at the right time. Idiot. Right button at the wrong time. What are you stupid? Yeah. <laughs> Career of the next decade. Yeah. Prompt engineer. Yeah. I already feel like I'm a button pusher. You know, Kelly, Kelly will like, do you need a finger massage? Is your button pushing finger? It was like a Jetsons gag, right? <laughs> Honey, my button pushing finger is killing me. <laughs> That's nice. Do you have a hard day at the office, George? <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. <laughs> I don't know how much you want to give away about this um, secret, wonderful, amazing uh, protocol that you introduced me to on .NET Rocks Rocks that I have gone on to utilize with my customers, and and it's a win-win, win-win all the way. Um, I don't know how much you want to divulge. What I would say is you should, what, listen to the podcast Ditching Hourly? Is that yeah, a good start? Good. Probably an introduction to value pricing is if you go to valuepricingbootcamp.com, there's a six day email course. It's free. Okay. You, just like, you can ask questions by replying. I get all the emails. That's, right. the, that's the quickest introduction to it, especially for software developers, but I didn't invent it. I mean, yeah. I, I kind of, I kind of localized it for software developers. Yeah, you applied but, it to software. Right. There've been uh, plenty of people before me who have written giant books on it. You know, Alan Weiss and, uh, the Verisage people, um, Ron Baker from Verisage. There's tons of them, but it, it was it was brand new to me. It was mostly from like the accounting and the management consulting space where people had been using it in the past. And I, I am the first person I know of that applied it to software development. Well, I had projects. never heard of it before. And if you say there are giant tomes written on it, I'm not going to read those, but... <laughs> The way you distilled it down uh, into practical language just made or resonated with me, and I uh, used it on. I've used it on a number of projects, but but here's what we're talking about. Basically, you should be interested if you are a service provider, a, a one person service provider, Especially. and by service, a uh, software developer, a uh, graphic artist, um, you know, somebody that is hired for a particular job. And you charge by the hour. Uh -huh. And so your premise is? My premise is, if you're charging for your time, there's an artificial ceiling on your income. Yeah. And and hourly billing punishes you for getting better at what you do. Right. So if you've got the financial incentive to not get better, or you ignore the financial incentive and you get better anyway, you're punished financially. It doesn't make any sense. It's not good for you. I could go into a dozen reasons why it's bad for your clients too. Right. And as the, a software developer, we, um, I had been burned in the past by, you know, saying, uh, I'll charge you X amount of money for this project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't 
write down exactly what you're going to do and agree on that and sign, seal, deliver it, uh, you'll be arguing about it. And now you're quibbling. And, and if you're hourly, you, this is what happens in software. If you're hourly, you get to the end of the project and the customer wants you to fix bugs and you're like, fine, my, you got to pay me my rate. And they're like, no, you got to, you got to fix these bugs right now. And that, that little tift at the end of a project generally causes so many problems sometimes that it just fails altogether. It's nuts. Like yeah, it's, it's nuts. nuts. So God, where do I start? I mean, I've probably have 500 hours of content on this, but, but the concept in broad strokes is, especially as a soloist, if you want to scale your business up past maybe two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000 a year, uh. you have to create some kind of leverage and you cannot do that if you're trading money for hours, because right. if the deal is, if you say it's 200 bucks an hour and they buy an hour, how long does it take you to fulfill that? Right. It takes an hour. And time is your cost. I mean, yeah, you got to buy a laptop and pay for your internet connection, but that's throw away. That's nothing. It's a rounding error. Uh. You know, so your time is your cost. And if you are, if you are tying your income to your cost and that cost is time, you cannot scale past a, cur a certain point. Right. Um, you just can't raise your hourly rate high enough to keep up with how fast you get better at what you do. Right. So what are your options? Your options are, if, you, if you're billing by the hour, your options are, you know, double the number of hours that you work. That doesn't sound like fun. Right. Or you could double your hourly rate, but that would price you way out of the market probably because right. almost everybody will just pick someone cheaper who's still really expensive. Right. Or you can hire a bunch of mini-me's to work for cheap and then you bill them out. And you yeah. take the delta between, and, and that works. That definitely works. But a lot the, of people the, do that. Yeah, a lot of people do that. The, and and it's fine if you want to be a leader and you want to, you know, be responsible for that big group of people. But if right. you don't want to do that and you uh -huh. scale that way, you're just going to be a terrible boss. Uh -huh. And when I'm talking to someone and they're like, maybe I should hire a bunch of people. Is that like, should I do that? And I'm like, are you ready to fire a bunch of people? Because right. that that's the flip side. And they're like, no, I could never fire anyone. I'm like, well, then you definitely are not ready to hire anyone. Right. So what are the other ways to scale? There's three ways to scale uh, an expertise-based business, which is what we're talking about. Uh -huh. One, an, an obvious one is products. Create, package your expertise as a product. Right. Maybe uh, ebook, video course, something like that. Sure. Um, another way is to create productized services where you publish that, you know, a, a fixed scope service at a published price on your website. Uh -huh. You say, I will do X, Y, and Z for $5,500. Uh -huh. And this is what the ideal buyer can expect to get from that. And yep. you just sell it like a, like a lamp or like a, a bottle right. of vitamins. Like a commodity. Right. Or if you do want to do project work and you're currently doing project work by the hour, the way to create leverage without hiring is to value price. And, and, and let me just, let me see if I can give the elevator pitch here. Mm -hmm. Value pricing is figuring out, in, a, in essence, value pricing is figuring out what is the value to the customer of what I'm providing. Monetary value, time-based value, uh, you know, um, just the value of, of being you versus somebody else. And you come up with a price based on that your perceived value of what you're doing for them mm -hmm. and you actually ask them questions that confirm in your mind what that value is mm -hmm. and so in essence you can give them a fair price that's probably going to be twice as much as you would make or more if you charge them hourly mm -hmm. they're happy and they pay the they pay one fee, right? They don't. Yep. They don't pay half here, half later. They, it's none of that. It's and they pay up front. Yeah, yeah. That has been a challenge sometimes. Yeah, there's so many there's so many ob objections and questions that come after the elevator pitch, right? Which are like one of them, for example, is is this is like oh you're just gouging them. You're just right. trying to find out how much yeah. money they have and taking all of it. Right. And it, no, it's not that. I don't care what the budget is. The budget's probably wrong. Right. Because if a client comes to you with a big project where they are not the expert and they're looking for an expert, uh. 
they don't even have the qualifications to budget for it because right. they don't even know. Like they've they've self diagnosed. They've picked a a a, a way forward. Uh-huh. It's probably not even right. It's probably not the yeah. best way forward. Right. So when someone would when I would go into a sales interview with a with a lead or a prospect, I would essentially try and talk them out of working with me. Yeah. Using what I call the why conversation, which yeah. is why this, why now, and why me. Yep. And the three questions. Mm-hmm. And through that process, we would uncover together why they even want to do this. Right. Is this really the right thing to do? Is now the right time to do it? Why would you hire someone expensive like me instead of using interns yeah, or employees I'm not cheap. or offshore? That's it. I, no, I'll can, be the most expensive option. Yeah. You can go hire a team from Bangalore right now mm-hmm. and it's going to cost you a fraction. Why are you, why are you talking to me? Right. So at the, at the end of a, it's hard to do. I'm not going to say it's easy to yeah. do. It takes practice. It's like a performance art. You don't, mm-hmm. you don't just read a book and now you can play guitar, right? It's, right. You, right. you need to, or stand up comedy. You got to, you got to learn how to do this. Right. And, and the ultimate result do, is they're happy. The ultimate result is they're clear about what they become much, much clearer about not what they want you to do, uh, but what they're trying to accomplish. Right. And how they're going to know whether or not it's a success. Yeah. So if you if you feel like at the end of that conversation that you could contribute to that success in some way, uh, then you can give them a proposal. They think you can because otherwise they wouldn't be talking to you. Right. They think you can contribute to some transformation that they want to make in their business. Uh, they believe it. When I talk to someone, I want to make sure I believe it uh, and that they're not wrong. Right. And then I will say, all right. For somebody like this in this situation, business this size, this has got to be worth at least 100k a year. Uh-huh. And so I'll take that value. It's right. not exact. It doesn't need to be exact. But I mean, you just think, think about it. That's the cost of an engineer that they would hire. It's nothing. Yeah, it's a rounding error. Right. <laughs> so if you if if you're like, okay, this has got to be worth about 100k. Let's uh-huh. just say for round numbers. Uh-huh. It could be a lot higher. Then I'm going to come up with three prices based on that value. And then I'm going to decide what the scope is. What is the scope that I'm willing to do to right. contribute to the desired outcome at these three prices? Right. And the idea of scoping last instead of scoping first, which is what most developers do, uh, is a complete mind blower. But scoping first is why, like you said earlier, if you ever did a fixed fixed price project in the past, it was almost certainly cost plus. Uh-huh. Based on what you, what they told you the scope was going to be, right. they're not the expert, but they told you what to do. Sure. And so you went and did it and it didn't achieve the outcome that they never told you they wanted. Right. So they're silently un, unsatisfied. Yeah. So their incentives are quite different than yours yeah. in that case. Your incentive is just to keep billing hours. Yeah. Their incentive is to get you to do more for less. I don't want to get paid more for working slower. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the it idea so you 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 talk about aligning your incentives with the customer and uh, that that resonated with me big time because now yeah. we're both working toward the same thing. They have paid me probably more than I would get if I was working hourly and we are both and and you say, "Look, I'm not going to stop programming. I'm not going to stop working until you say it's done." Not I right. say you tell me that's it. We've accomplished all of the things that we set out to do. We're done. So that can be terrifying to developers who yeah. are used to thinking only about scope. But right. if you think about outcomes, yeah, you get a lot more control over scope about what gets built. So even if a client came to me and said, eh, we've got these mock-ups of all of these screens and all this stuff we wanted mm. to build. Can you give us a ballpark? Yeah. I'd be like, nope. No. Let's talk about what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I'll decide what scope needs to be done uh. to achieve that outcome. So the outcomes for in a software scenario, there's if you're doing building internal software, usually it's a productivity based outcome. Uh, okay. Where they want to increase productivity by some percentage. If it's a client facing outcome, it could be a bunch of different things like uh we want to get to ten K MRR with uh beta customers. MRR is what? Monthly recurring revenue. Uh-huh. So if it's like an MVP for a SaaS, let's say. Okay, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
MVP, minimum sorry, viable sorry, product sorry. for sorry, software as a service. Yeah, so minimum viable product for so for so if someone wants to build an app, like what's a what's a what's a SaaS? Oh, that software would know for about? a service is some website that you subscribe to, like Gmail, for example. You know, you have right. a Google account, you pay a certain amount of money a month, okay. and it is software as a service. It's a service fee that you pay monthly. Right, Adobe, yeah. Photoshop. So you got it, yeah. Right, so you're paying monthly for access for this this tool that you use right? or that your clients use. So if, if you wanted to build, if your goal is to, to bootstrap a, a software-based startup that's uh. going to create an app that, you, that your clients or your customers pay for online, $39 a month uh. to schedule your social media posts or something like that. Right, right. And they want to get to a hundred users paying $39 a month. And that's my goal. Right. They, you, you have a lot more autonomy around what actually gets built and when it gets built. Exactly. You, you might have some insights for tech that they could Mm -hmm. use to get to that goal, to improve that outcome that they hadn't even thought of. And because your incentives are aligned, that can, that's a conversation that can happen. And by the way, it happens before they, before you do the work. Yeah, it happens before they make a purchase decision. Yeah. So, or another goal could be, we want this, we want to prove a concept that we can, um, that we can get funding for. Right. So we want to be able to say that this, we've prove, proven that this GPT-4 model is uh, sufficient for <laughs> creating show notes for podcasts uh, at scale. And then we're going to take that as long as it works and we, and it demos really well, we're going to take that to Silicon Valley and get investors to do it. And if we we'll like put our money this, in Silicon Valley bank, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> well, I guess that worked out, but, <laughs> but yeah, the idea is you, you want to understand. So now both of these customers, like someone who wanted to get to 10 K MRR yep. bootstrapping versus someone who's trying to get funding from VCs, venture capitalists. Yes. Completely different desired outcome. Yeah. Both people might have come to you and said, we need you to build us a Rails app that does these three things. Yeah, it's a web app for those who are listening Yeah, and don't understand we, yeah. what we're saying. Sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. I'll just continue to clarify. Yeah, I like to be specific in the examples be- to keep it from being hand waving. Yeah, sure. So somebody comes and says, we want an app that does this. And if you don't know why and what it's for, then your 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 incentives are completely different. Get me a hamburger. Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? It's just mm-hmm. not, you're not partnering with, like, th- this is a good lever that I can use to kind of open people's minds, which is that a lot of people say they want to be partner with their client, but they don't actually do any of the actions that would cause them to partner with them. For example, taking some risk. Yeah. Your clients are taking a massive amount of risk, hire, you know, considering hiring you, especially at a potentially unbounded hourly rate. Right. Yeah, and they hate that. They hate it. How much is this going to cost? Well, we estimate blah, blah, blah. Usually it's about. But it could go $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 over budget, and now they're not happy at all. Yeah, imagine walking in to buy a car and saying, how much is this Subaru Outback? And they're like, well, (laughs) they're usually about $45,000, but why don't you. Ah, Could be seventy, could be eighty. Commit to buying it. Give us, give us 30,000 and then in a couple of years, we'll let you know how much you owe us. Yeah. Nobody would buy a car. No one would buy a car. (laughs) It's insanity. Yep. Yep. I talked to a guy today about doing social media, making shorts of, of, you know, I've got probably five, 500, 600, 700 hours of audio content. Uh. And, and this guy cold emailed me and was like, I noticed that you don't have any Instagram. You have nothing on Instagram. I was uh-huh. like, yeah, I, I don't like going on Instagram because I can't. It, it's like an addiction. It just, yeah. I can't resist it. If you're over 50, it. you're like, what is it? Instagram. <laughs> it's Twitter with pictures, but it's it's <laughs> super addictive. You can't, yeah. I can't, I lose 45 minutes every time I open the app. So I deleted it. So yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I noticed you're not on Instagram, but you have like a massive amount of stuff on YouTube. Yeah. What if I took all that, you know, you know, a hundred or 200 hour long episode youtube youtube episodes uh, and of your podcast and i cut them into like 30 second chunks of like really good quotes uh, and put it on instagram for you and i said all right i'm interested this that's is a cold great email. service cold email right so of course he didn't tell me the price he wanted uh, to get me on the phone to like feel me out right 
So we talk, whatever. That's fine. I get it. I get what's going on. Young guy, hustling. Uh I I appreciate it. Yeah. So we finally get to the price and it's non-trivial. So I go, all right, what can I expect to get for my $2,000 a month? You know, 10, two videos a day, two shorts a day, five days a week. So 50 bucks, uh, 50 bucks. He does it like literally does everything. So like, like I give him the, the price isn't the point here really, but, but I was, it's non-trivial. But you the, wanted to the, know how much you're going to, yeah. Okay. He said you, he gave you a price. Now you want to know what you get. Right. What yeah. do I get? So he's, he's talking about deliverables the whole time. Okay. You know, per, per short, per video or reels, we're talking about Instagram reels uh. per reels price of like 50 bucks. So it's all deliverables based and he's pricing it based on his cost. Right. Right. So, I, so I, of course I'm like just waiting for the moment that I can say like, well, what should I expect to get for my $2,000? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, well, it's hard to say. I mean, and I was like, well, what's a range? I mean, you have, you've told me that you have a bunch of existing clients. What's the most? Yeah. What's the best result you've ever gotten? Uh. 2000 additional followers on Instagram. Yeah, that would be a high end. What, but, but have you ever done this for someone and they've gotten no followers? He's like, it happens. It's pretty rare. So I'm like, so I'm like, yeah, you want me to give you 2000 bucks to maybe have nothing happen. Literally nothing. Right. Or maybe get best case scenario, 200 additional followers on Instagram. And I said, okay, let's say best case scenario. I get 2000. Well, he didn't even say, no, he didn't say 2000. He said a thousand. So that's like what? Two dollars. Two dollars per follower on Instagram. Okay. If I paid two thousand bucks, and I was like, "What should I expect?" Let's just say you hit a home run. It's genius. My content is so. You've been telling me this whole right, phone right. call. My content is amazing. So let's just say I hit a home run. <laughs> let's say you're right. Let's say you're right, and let's say I get a thousand new followers on Instagram. What will that do for me? Well, you'll. He, it was like, well, you'll have yeah. More followers. Yeah, I mean, more like, followers. Yeah, more followers. That's the goal. Right. That's yeah. the goal. And I'm like, yeah, but this whole premise, the whole predicate, this is all predicated on me getting more listeners to my podcast. How am I going to get them from Instagram to my podcast? Right. It's like, uh. So now imagine, imagine if that I guy. I actually know the answer to that question. Oh, do The tell. answer is because I used to work with somebody who put um, content for us, the two keto dudes on Instagram. And basically, every time there was a new post, if there was, you you don't put links in Instagram posts, or at you least can, you right? didn't. You, yeah, but what you do is you have a profile, and that profile has the link of the day that you want, and you can change that link anytime. Mm-hmm. So basically, when somebody puts out an Instagram and you want to link to a specific, um, you know, a specific podcast or whatever, you put the link in the profile. Uh, and that's that's how it works. But I didn't know that until I talked to somebody about social media on Instagram. Right. And I, I think he would have said that if we I had pressed the issue, but still it'd be like, well, what's the percentage? Like what's the conversion rate? Right. Aren't these people like these people are getting the content for free on Instagram? Aren't they just gonna stay there? You know, it's like so but imagine if this if this guy came to me and said and he knew like what if he knew all the averages what right, if he knew right. all the numbers yeah. what if he focused down on people just like me and he came in and he said for two thousand dollars a month I'll make you four thousand dollars a month guaranteed right and I'd be like how are you going to do that and he'd tell me and he'd say I've worked with twenty people just like you uh-huh. who sell courses and do all this other stuff. And if you don't make $4,000 a month after, say, six months or something, I'll give you all your money back. Yeah. I would have said yes instantly. Yeah, easy. No, r- no risk. Right. So anyway, that's an example. And it's basically, he's he's telling you what you're going to get out of it. Whereas, yeah. you know, the the guy would, would, is focused on followers as the end-all be-all. Yeah. He's used to selling to people who care about vanity metrics yeah and it's like it's like you want me to give you a very specific dollar amount every month Uh, what is the very specific dollar amount i'm going to get back uh then it's just like oh it's really hard to say it's it sometimes it can take six months it's like all right yeah so the other thing we should talk about in your method 
is that the first time that a customer contacts you and you have that initial phone call, and I love these phone yeah. calls, right? <laughs> or Zoom call or whatever. Right. They're feeling you out. They're telling you everything, mostly stuff that you don't care about, right? About the history of their product and the this and the that and the whys and the wherefores. And, you know, yeah, they just go pitched. on and they want to hear themselves talking. And you're just like, hmm, yeah, really cool. That's, that's really cool. And, you know, you do need to know some, some of that stuff. And then sometimes they'll go into, we think that we want to use X technology or this technology or that technology. And, and, you know, I say, oh, well, that's, yeah, that's possible. It's an interesting idea. We should talk more about that. But, um, after they're done and you let them talk and you let them talk because that feels good, right? You let them talk, you make a few notes and you say, all right, I have some questions for you, right? And then you give them the three questions and you kind of have, you got to have something to write with, right? I, yeah. I find having a pen and a piece of paper is, is, is better than, you know, when somebody's talking to you, them hearing you type. I agree. That's, that's rude. I agree. Because you're not you're not listening, you're really not. Yeah. You're you're typing. Yeah. You might be able to listen and type at the same time, but I just have a piece of paper. Write it down. So you give them the three questions: why, uh, why do you want to write software? Or if you're um, selling, you know, social media services, why do you want to get on social media? Why do you want to do Instagram? Why do you want all this stuff? Right? Yeah. And and they tell you that this is why. And you say, isn't there some sort of off the shelf thing that you could buy? Like, why do you want to have, why do you want to write it? Why do you want to hire somebody like me to do it? Uh, so you get them all these questions, you write them down. And I love this one. Why now? Can it wait a year? Can it wait two years? And, yeah, you know, just, it, you, what you want to do is you want to find out what their motivation is for contacting you in the first place. And part of that is time based, right? I remember having a customer that when we had this chat, they said, um, well, uh, we don't think our server is going to make it through the month, like the next, next couple of months. It's really janky and it's being held together with duct tape and bailing wire and it, it's causing us so many headaches. Like it, it's urgent. Oh, it? Write that down. That's important, <laughs> right? So yeah. time is very important to them. Timing. Yeah, and, the timing. Yeah. Right. And then why me? I'm not cheap. And I always say that because I'm not. I, you know, if it yeah. isn't worth it to me financially, then I won't do it. Yeah, well, why you would could, you hire someone expensive like me? Yeah. Why you could do? Why wouldn't you just hire a college kid to do your social media or, or a teenager or, you know, if software, a team in India or, or off, offshore somewhere? Um, and, you know, they, if, if, if they've contacted you because you're you, they'll say, well, we, you have a good reputation and you came highly recommended and yada, yada, yada. So you write all those things down. And then you say, uh, all right, so here's how I work. I'm going to give you at the end of this whole process, a proposal that will be one price. And it's, I don't bill hourly. It's going to be one price and I'll stop working till it's done. And they like that nearest perk up. And mm -hmm. you say, but first, before we even do that, we have to go into phase one, which is, I call it documentation and discovery phase. And it's going to cost you money up front, five grand, 10 grand, whatever you think yep. is, is going to keep them committed. And you say in two weeks time, or, you know, if they say a week, then it's 10 grand. If they say two weeks, it's five. This um, is you know, in two weeks time, I'm going, we're, we're going to talk and we're going to build a spec together, all the things that you want. We're going to talk about why you want them and all this stuff. And I will, at the end of that, give you a detailed spec and a, a price. And like you said, three prices, right? The, the minimum viable product price, the price that includes all the things that they wanted, that they talked to you about in, in the discovery and phase. And then uh, a bells and whistles price, an extra price where you can bring in, you know, things that they didn't think of that yep. actually add value to what they're trying to do. Yeah, that's one way to break up the three options. Yeah, yes. one way. Yeah, that's that's what I usually do. And and um, you know, you pay up front, and when you're done, when we're done with that, you still can take that spec 
and take it to someone else. And I actually had a customer that did that after we were mm-hmm. done with that phase. They said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to take this to someone shop else around. and that's fine. But, um, you, you'll have a spec that you can shop to the lowest bidder if you choose to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a great, right, right. And yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's got value. The spec has value. It has value. Right. And mm-hmm. then, uh, they decide, you know, A, B or C and you always put the prices at the bottom of the document. Right. Yep. You have all I'm laughing these tricks. Because, I'm laughing because it's like straight out of the playbook. I right? know. And it works so well. And, but, yeah. but the thing is, is that every single customer that I've engaged, uh, save for one, which probably shouldn't have been done this way. It should have been an hourly because there were two other people involved and it was kind of a nightmare to, yes. to keep track of. But, yes. um, all of the customers that I've engaged myself with this have been ecstatic about the results. One of them even hired the developer away from me who I was contracting out, right? How much yeah. is it going to cost for me to deal with this guy directly? Yeah. Customer, that's the thing. It's like, I'm laughing, but but I wouldn't want people to think that it's a malicious kind of laugh. No, the, it's not. The, no, the clients love it. They love it. Yeah. If you can get them, good, good, let's, let me re-say that. Good clients love this. Yeah. Clients that want to negotiate, want to nickel and dime you, want to negotiate down, right. want to get, want to chisel you down to the lowest possible, you know, price buyers. Yeah. Price buyers and control freaks. And, and if you build, you know, you don't want to be building shoes for cobbler's kids. And you can smell the warning signs coming. Like they're like, can we pay half up front and half at the end? And you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> this is my, this is my deal. You can take it or you can shop it around. Go for it. Yeah. It's fine. Go. It's, I have no skin off my right. nose. Just go ahead. Get someone cheap. It's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll introduce you to junior developers who, sure. you know, aren't book solid. Uh huh. But right. So, it's, and so, so I, I guess the other, the flip side of this is it, it won't work if you suck. Oh, the, 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 the right. <laughs> The precondition for all of this is that you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Yeah. Which usually is the point at which people start to really feel the pain of hourly billing because yeah. they're like, I'm getting undercut by chumps yep. who don't know what they're doing and are going to do garbage work yep. and write garbage code. Uh, but I'm getting compared apples to apples with these people. Right. And and the, the, the buyers see no meaningful difference. They're not sophisticated enough right. to see a meaningful difference between A and B. So what's, what's the last thing they can see? The hourly rate. So they sort by price and uh-huh. they pick the second cheapest one because nothing else is meaningful right. to them. And you just start losing business. And the faster you get, the worse you get paid. Yeah. So And it snowballs it, too. So every new customer that I talk to, I go back to my other customers and I say, hey, can you give me an uh, anonymous is fine, just a, a testimonial about the process. And, uh, you know, and I add those to the to the proposal. Yeah. And if you're if you're delivering results, business outcomes mm. to business owners, they're going to be like, yeah, yep. happy to. And, and the testimonials that they give are full of numbers like increased our conversion rate by 30 percent in one year and as like other business owners see that yeah. like, whoa increased our productivity by 50 percent. we were going to have to hire an entire new bullpen of customer service people but then we didn't have to right good stuff yeah well uh js it's been a pleasure talking to you it always is same here likewise yeah i really enjoyed our dinner the other night at the capitol grill in providence that was amazing it's beautiful. We'll have to do that again. Have to have you and your family down here sometime in the summer where we can do something on the smoker. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. My pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks. You're listening to No Excuse for Boredom from noexcuseforboredom.com and wherever you get your podcasts. All the music you're hearing, I've composed and produced myself, unless otherwise noted. I'm solely responsible for creating, recording, editing, and producing this content. If you'd like some help getting your podcast sounding this good, drop me a line at carl at franklins.net or on Mastodon at carlfranklin at techhub.social. If you'd prefer not to hear ads, consider buying me a latte once a month via Patreon 
and you'll get ad-free episodes delivered right to the palm of your hand. Go to noexcuse.carlfranklin.com to sign up. And hey, don't take any wooden nickels. Music